and welcome to Build. I'm Simon Atkins, and as always, we are live from London. Now, today, we're joined by a singer-songwriter who has had over 7 million in record sales. He's here to talk about his brand new album. Will you please put your hands together for James Morrison, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Very welcome. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Thank Very you well. so much for joining us. I can't complain. I'm good. Now, before we kick off, we're going to ask the guys at home to get involved. So if you've got a question for James and you want to get involved, please tweet us at Bill Series LDN, or you can leave a comment below this video if you're watching live on Facebook. Thank you so much for coming and joining us today. Pleasure. So how are you? What's going on? I'm well. I'm good. <laughs> I'm in the midst of uh, just about to go out on tour soon. So yeah, I'm exci it's an exciting time. Good. Ha and so the brand new album launches on the 8th of March. Yeah. You're stronger than you know. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about the vibe of this album. Um, well, it was made quite quickly. Uh, I, I wrote the songs over like probably four year period of time. Uh, one of the songs is like written nearly 10 years ago. So I've had a lot of time to write the songs. And then um, we just started recording really quick. We did the whole album in like two weeks. Wow. We spent a week doing the tracks. I did 16 songs. And then we spent another week just doing harmonies and, and overdubs and horns and stuff. So yeah, it's, it's, it's got the sort of, the time to sort of make sure the songs are right. But then it's done really quickly. So it's not overthought and it's got yeah, it's just got a good vibe. The vibe's still there. It's not been overplayed or over-rehearsed. So when you write songs 10 years ago and then you, like, revisit them now, that's that's pretty crazy, isn't it? Yeah. Do you kind of forget about them? Yeah, I, 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 it, well, when uh, I got played the song, the, uh, So Beautiful, I was like, what's this? <laughs> I was like, this is pretty cool. <laughs> and then I started singing and I was like, oh, my God, it's me. What the hell? Uh, I'm ne I'd never say that about my own tunes. But I think I just got caught off guard. I'd, I'd completely forgotten about it. Uh, and then when I heard it, it was just really relevant uh, for the time. You know, It just and felt like I was ready to sing it then. So is, is somebody replaying that song to you? Or do you have them stored on like a laptop or something? No, nah, a lot of the songs I haven't actually got access to just because uh, they were done on in demos, I got a print off of the CD of the day, I probably lost it, or put it in the garage somewhere, <laughs> and not really thought about it again. Um, yeah, I don't know, yeah, I don't really sit around listening to old songs, I'm more about writing new songs, okay. and focusing on moving forward. So, um, yeah, I was quite surprised when someone goes, oh, listen to this, from ages ago, and it's good, and I've forgotten about it. I'm usually pretty good at knowing when I've got a tune or not. So your lead single, My Love Goes On, features Joss Stone, yeah. and we're going to have a little look at a clip of it now. My Love Goes On, a really catchy number, a catchy tune. Hey. I said catchy tune. Yeah, it's all right, isn't it? Yeah, I think, um, <laughs> yeah, I'm, ple yeah, I'm right. pleased with it. Yeah, and I, it's took me a long time to get to the point where I can enjoy the process of making music and not feel really embarrassed when I hear it back. Yeah. So did you used to listen back to yourself and go, oh my God, I literally, I hate the sound of that. Or cringe, nah, cringe it's when more you hear your like, own voice. I just, I just, mainly, normally my face and my hair <laughs> are a problem for me. Uh, and then, and then the sort of, the naivety in the recording, I just hear like what I should have done and that's not there. Basically, yeah, it's just self, self sort of self critique stuff that no one else is bothered about, but I notice. So where did the title from for the album come from? Um, I wrote a song for my other half um, after we'd had a baby. And she was feeling really down. And she's six years older than me, so she's, she was coming up for 40. And she was, feel, she was like, mm, I'm feeling old and <laughs> I haven't done anything with my life. And I'm just a mum. And I was like, well, I think you're amazing. I think that, you know, you, I don't know, she, she was like my hero at that time. We'd been through so much and she was so strong. And I just thought, why don't you see what I see? And it really, it, it made me feel sad that she felt that low about mm. herself. So when I went into the studio, I was like, I've got to write her a song that when she puts it on, she can't help but feel good. Um, and that was my goal from the start, really. So yeah, and I wrote this song called Power. Does she love it? She loves it. 
Yeah, she played it the other day and she was crying to me saying, uh, this song really makes me feel good when I listen to it. So it was quite it was it was quite an emotional moment for me to hear that from her, knowing that that's what I wanted from it. It's also so sweet that you can actually write a song mm. for your for your partner. Yeah, she I mean, love it. I think I wouldn't normally be that sickly sweet, <laughs> but that it's not really a sickly sweet song. It's not. It's not me saying, "Oh, I love you," and you're just great. It's more like, you know, you're a woman who's been through so much, and she was saying, "Oh, I'm not 17 anymore," and I was like, "I'm glad you're not 17 because you don't really know too much when you're 17." Mm. And now she's 40. She's just an amazing woman. Yeah, I don't know. I just wanted her to feel power and, yeah, in and her experience and and everything that we've been through. And plus, she looked the best she'd ever looked. I was looking at her thinking, you're so fit. <laughs> what is the problem? I don't get it. <laughs> um, yeah, but now, now, now she's come, she's at where I'm at, which is great. So see. she's she's happy and she feels yeah, empowered yeah, she and does, feels... Yeah. And it's coming out on International Women's Day. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah, which is a really cool coincidence, I think. You know, I never wrote the album for, like, women or anything, but I, I definitely wrote a few of the songs with Jill in mind, and I wanted to write her some songs that would make her feel good and point out what we've been through, but in a really subtle way. Well, know? hopefully you'll also empower other women. Yeah, hopefully. I mean, yeah, I'd like to think so. I'd like so, to think so. So... I read that this is an album that you've always wanted to make. Mm -hmm. So has it been a labour of love making this album? Yeah, 100%. Yeah, there's not been one moment of making any of it where I've had to think about anything other than just doing music, making music that I want to make and in the way that I want to make it. Like I say, we had to a long time of, of writing. So when it came time to record, it was just really simple. It's just like, let's just get on with it and do it quick. And I've been talking about making an album with a live band since the first album. Because mm. um, when I started out, in my head, I was like R&B, soul, rock, blues. I wasn't pop, but I ended up being pop. And then it really annoyed me that that's how I was viewed. Like, oh, James Morrison is like a romantic balladeer guy. He's like, <laughs> you give me and all that. And it just annoyed me, because I feel like I've got so much more strength than that and so much more power that I just wanted to match up the material to how I feel as an artist a little bit more. So I moved away from the poppy aspect a little bit and just tried to write songs that remind me of music that I was brought up on, like Sam and Dave or Sam Cooke or Otis Redding or even Michael Jackson. Or, uh, you know, when I was singing My Love Goes On, I was thinking of Michael Jackson a little bit. <laughs> you know, the way he just digs in. Yeah, and just like, go... Oh, when your whole world is shattered, just mm, give it some beans and some, <laughs> some sort of, you know, just going for it a little bit more. Um, yeah, so I think that's why I'm pleased with it. And I've always wanted to make an album that is just people in a room and they're just playing really well with songs that are good songs and, and there's no extra stuff. You know, I didn't put any strings on it for that reason. OK. Really. I kept string arrangements away from the studio... And, uh, uh, you know, I've put horns on a few of the tracks, but nothing nothing too much that gets, you know, it's a soul album in the sense that I'm singing from my soul. It's not a soul album in the sense that it's horns and Motown, but equally there are elements of that in there. But so to me, speaking it's more about the emotion and, and what I'm singing about okay. that brings the soul to the album. Okay. Speaking of soul, you, you, um, we saw that you did that, um, that single with Joss Stone. Yeah. So what is it like working with her? And you know her, don't you? From She gave you a Brit Awards <laughs> yeah. back in 2007. Yeah, she did. So is that yeah. the first time you met her? That was the first time I'd ever met her, yeah. But I used to listen to her on the radio a lot when I was cleaning vans <laughs> for a living. <laughs> I'd be like washing vans and I'd hear like, fell in love with the girl. I'd be like, oh, who is that? And uh, she was only like 16 at the time. But I remember thinking, yeah, she's a great singer and doing sort of music that I stylistically really liked. Um, but then to be working with her full circle like 12, 14 years later is mad to me. But equally, it was an easy decision because I've met, I've, I've met her before and she's really easygoing and we naturally sort of had a good vibe 
Um, and so, yeah, I just sort of relied on that. Really. I, was, I was hoping that when we did the song, it was still going to be like that. But I got there and she was terrible. <laughs> nah, she was great. She was she was everything I hoped, you know. I got there and she was exactly the same as but, she was when I met her years ago. Just a lovely, open person, really friendly, very spiritual, beautiful person. And her um, voice is incredible. But, I know, but, well, that's the other thing. <laughs> you know, on top of all that, her voice is ridiculous. But your both of your voices, I think, are they, they work really well together. Yeah. Do, you, do you think they work well together? Mm. They they do. I think it's it's a great it's a great track. I mean, I'm lucky. She likes all the same music that I love. You know, I, if I talk about Al Green, she knows all his songs. James Brown, anyone that I, you know, musically Stevie Wonder, anyone that I love, she loves too. And plus, she sang with most of them. She sang with nearly every legend that go it. <laughs> I mean, there's clips of her singing with Ronnie Wood, Jeff Beck, Mavis Staples. Al Green, there's just, it's mad. It's yeah. how, you know, her reach and her, her, her power as a singer is always, it's been something that I've been inspired by. Um, and I've never got to work with as many cool people as her, but I do think she deserves more recognition as a British soul singer. And I was quite happy to sort of let her come to the table and, and deliver a really good vocal on a song with me. Um, because then that allows me to be in the same category as her, which is British soul. And I've always wanted to be that. Um, we have a question in on social. Darren Drake on Facebook wants to know, who are your musical influences and is there anyone in particular um, who you drew influence from for this new album? Krista Berg. No joke. No uh, um, <laughs> I I don't know. I just listen to a lot. I listen to a lot of music that I've always listened to, um, but I was a little bit more honed in on um, you know the sounds of the music that I loved and trying to get a little bit of that into the album. I was listening to a lot of Dusty Springfield, um, Al Green, Marvin Gaye, Stevie Wonder, Sam and Dave, Otis Redding, uh, Aretha Franklin. Do you still listen to all of them? Yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, it's some of the best music that's ever made, to me. Michael Jackson. Any music where the singer is going for it and you really feel what they're singing, I'm always inspired by singers like that. Um, now, family is a consistent the theme throughout this album. Mm -hmm. You spoke about um, the power which you wrote for your wife, but you also wrote a song for your daughter. Can you yeah. tell us about that? Yeah, um, well, it's... It, I don't know. I, I, basically, a lot of people said, oh, you, you know, I, I basically told the story about my daughter coming home from school a bit upset because kids were teasing her about the fact that I was her dad. And you're never going to be a singer like your dad. And your dad's rubbish and all this stuff. And she got really upset by it. And it just really <laughs> made me really sad because, you know, I've got, I'm not pleased easily and I love my kid and she's an amazing kid, you know, and even if she wasn't my kid, I'd be like, she's amazing. Um, and so to see her so upset just really did my head in. And I just thought I wanted to write her a song that reminded her she can do what she wants to do and have confidence in doing it and, and just sort of, I don't know, I wanted to write her a song that if I wasn't there, she could play it and it'd make her feel better. Um, yeah, I don't know, I just sort of, I, I always wanted a song like that, you know, for like, if I if my dad wrote me a song that I could listen to, now he's not here, it'd really help at certain times. And I thought if I write her a song that helps her when I'm not here, then that's kind of what I wanted. But yeah, I don't know, it just, I just sort of had a go at writing a song and then it became this quite a big song um, that I just sort of, every time I heard it, it just felt really good. We're going to talk about your touring, but um, just touching on your family. Is it hard to be away from your family when you're touring? Or are you like, is that your time to, to spread your wings and have some fun? <laughs> um, I don't know. It is hard to be away, definitely. Because, the, you know, my one-year-old, she's grown so quick. And she's a proper daddy's girl. So I think my other half has a hard time when I'm away. Um, but, yeah, equally, I've been at home for a long time. So I'm kind of itching to get out on tour and play some gigs and do the other thing, which is the music. You know, it's all, I, I don't mind being, you know, I'm quite happy to be a normal dude 
at home, yeah. just James taking the kids to school and stuff like that. But after about a year and a half, I started going a bit mad. Like, but you want you, you I want need to have creative. that thing that I'm good at. Yeah, you know, I felt like you know, I don't know. Everyone was starting to get used to me hanging around in the village. <laughs> Are you coming out for a pint, at eight, James? And I'm like, no, I don't know. I've got writing to do and stuff. I don't know. It just got a bit too normal, and if I don't know, I really love being creative and singing. Music's have always been a massive part of my life, so I'm really excited to be making music again definitely so your album's out on the 8th and then you're off touring so yeah. where are you off to um, oh where are we going Norwich <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah all the ones on there and yeah. then some other stuff um, yeah I'm going to Europe I'm doing um, lots of dates in Europe in Switzerland in France I think I'm not sure actually mainly Switzerland Italy uh, Germany um, maybe Spain. I'm not sure. Uh, I don't like knowing too much. It feels boring if you know too much. I like I like sort of getting up and going. What are we doing today? But are there any places that you absolutely love playing at or performing at? Or like well, I just did uh, a trip to South Africa. Oh wow! Where so good. Uh, I did Johannesburg three nights in Johannesburg and then one in Cape Town. Yeah, it's it it one of the most beautiful places I've ever been. The it's, mountains are amazing. Yeah, the backdrops are just insane, aren't they? Yeah. Even in like... It's Cape definitely Bend. like, well, someone, someone like a god has got to have definitely have made all this <laughs> stuff because it's so amazing. Um, yeah, it was a be and really beautiful people, you know, um, not just looking, but just really very beautiful people that are just really open and very kind and, and very helpful. And considering it's such a dangerous... I've been told by everybody, oh, yeah, it's dangerous, don't go over there. You but did you shot. experience any danger? Because, I mean, no, obviously Cape Town I didn't, is, not is, one bit. But Johannesburg is supposed to be really dangerous. But then I was on, on like, a safe hotel okay. complex. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It wasn't like I was wandering around the ghetto. Oh, this is fine. Yeah, it was It was dodgy, but, I mean, you know, where isn't nowadays? You can get hurt, you can get, you know hurt in London or Manchester, you know, so it, I don't know, I don't. I think if you go in anywhere with that mentality, you're probably going to see stuff you don't want to see, whereas I went in thinking I'm going to see a beautiful country and I'm going to play some great gigs and then that's kind of what I got out of it, really. So you've been in the music industry since 2006. Mm. What are the highlights of your career for you or like kind of some of your very best moments? I know that's quite a big question. Yeah. Um, well, obviously, like meeting musical legends like Stevie Wonder and people like that, you know, Rod Stewart, um, Cat Stevens, or Yusuf Islam, is his <laughs> real name now. Um, just, re you know, meeting musical heroes is always an amazing thing. Um, but then to travel to countries like South Africa just because of my music is still quite mad to me. But um, And just, I suppose, you know, when, you, when you're playing to like sold out crowds, that's... That must be an incredible feeling when yeah. I'm singing your lyrics and like you yeah. know there to, to but watch But then it. it doesn't matter if it's a small gig or a big gig. Like, I, I like the small gigs just as much as those, even not more than the big gigs. Uh, the smaller gigs are just as meaningful, you know. I don't know. I just like I like those old school rock and roll, sweaty, close gigs where you can't really hide. It's just you walk, you're out on stage, you're doing your thing and. It, there's no tricks. You're just singing and singing songs with a great band. And, yeah, I don't know. That's what I was brought up in. That's where I learned my craft was in open mic bars and pubs and busking. So anything that feels too showbiz, it just feels a bit too far away. You know, from, from you have to work harder connecting with the audience, and I just like it when you don't have to concentrate on that. You can just go out and they're already there and... And and it's very, um, you know, they're participating in the gig. The audience is just as important as the performer on stage, sure. I think. You know, a, a, an audience can turn it around and make it the best gig you've ever played. And, of course, you feed off their energy, don't yeah. you? Like every so if they're, they're like, any time I've been to, um, you know, like I'm playing Dublin at the end of that tour, and I, the Dublin Olympia is one of my favourite yeah. gigs. Yeah, and the Dublin, the, the Irish crowds are good crowd. They, they love music. I mean, I was, I, I know, I know exactly. <laughs> I was going to say that, but yeah, it is one of my favourite places to play actually because they, you know, their heritage of music, like you know Van Morrison and even like people like Christy Moore, or even old school artists like Paul Brady. 
Um, I just love Irish voices, and any time I go over there, I feel like smug <laughs> that I'm allowed to go over and be appreciated by other people that love great music. So yeah, I don't know. I just I just love playing live. That's the main reason why I do all this stuff and put myself out there and put up with feeling insecure and negative and all that stuff is just because when I play live and I'm writing music, yeah. they're the things that I, look, I, I like doing, really. Before we go, um, is there anyone else that you would like to collaborate with or duet with if you had to pick one person? Um, I mean, a lifelong ambition would be to do a song with Stevie Wonder, but I don't know whether that's going to happen. Or Stevie, if you're... Watching. Please give me a chance. Please. Please, uh, <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. I think it depends on the person. If you get a person that's, you know, uh, got a really good voice, but they're difficult to work with, it's not going to be easy or yeah. enjoyable. Uh, whereas if you get someone like Joss, who's got a great voice and they're easy to work with, then it's, a, it's an actual experience rather than just a singing a session or whatever, you know. I, I just like getting uh, experience out of it. Like with Stevie, when I met Stevie Wonder, uh, someone pulled me up to his car, opened the door, and Stevie Wonder was sat there, and they introduced me as, oh, this is James Morrison. He's a singer from the UK. He didn't have a clue who I was. And he was just sort of sat there like, great, hey, and he put his hand out, shook his hand, and I was, I was just sort of fanboying over his music. Like, I love all your songs and that. But he must know who you are now at this stage. I don't know, doubt it. You're not dropping <laughs> uh, the line. And, and, then, and then his massive security guy, who's like seven foot, was like, yo, uh, Steve says you can go in the dressing room. And I was like, all right, cool. So I got to sit in his dressing room while he was warming up. And he, he told me a few jokes, and it was just cool. And, and I'll always remember that for the rest of my life. I just, I'll just i never forget that, you know, the day I spent sat in Stevie Wonder's dressing room. And he had all these lovely women around him with ball gowns on. Like, hey, baby, are you OK? <laughs> He's like, yeah, I'm good, I'm good. I just thought, what a legend. <laughs> what an absolute He's legend. legend. Yeah. James, unfortunately, that's all we've got time for. But thank you got so it. much. We've loved having you I appreciate you, you having me. Uh, yeah, it's been easy. Sofa. Thank you. James' new album, You're Stronger Than You Know, is out on the 8th of March. So go and grab yourself a copy. We'll be back tomorrow chatting about Ricky Gervais' new Netflix series, Afterlife. So do join us then. But for now, give it up one last time for James Morrison. Oh.